Hello everyone, my name is Ekaterina Solomina. I'm the co-founder of Future London Academy. We are here with Jess Leach, a principal at Adaptive Life. And we also have Callum behind the camera, that, whom you can't see. Um, so Jess, uh, thanks a lot for joining our discussion today. Tell us a bit more about what is Adaptive Lab. So Adaptive Lab is a design and innovation consultancy. Um, so we work with a whole range of different clients from public sector and from the private sector, and we help them to build new digital products and services and to help them build new businesses from scratch. I think your website says something about B2 businesses. Yes. What does it mean, building B2 businesses? Um, building a B2 business is about um, working with a client to help them understand what they would do if they could create a new business from scratch. So if they didn't have any of the status quo biases or issues that they had within their organisation, they didn't have any of the legacy systems that they had to deal with, um, if they could just start afresh with a clean slate, what would they want to build um, and how would they build a digital business from scratch? Isn't it a scary idea that you have to build <laughs> something from ground zero? Uh, it's scary or freeing. I think a lot of people find it to be quite freeing because just letting go of the status quo and thinking mm -hmm. about something that's completely new and different is actually something that people dream of, I think. Yeah. So you official title is Principal yeah. of Service Design, yes, is that correct? Yes, that's it. What does it mean? What, what do you do? do? <laughs> <laughs> so we design, uh, yeah, so, so we work with um, lots of different clients to design new services from mm -hmm. scratch. So um, we're, we work in digital mostly, so um, most of our services have some kind mm -hmm. of digital element. So um, that means kind of doing new kind of service strategies. It means helping clients who've got problems with existing services. So in some of the big organisations that we work with in London, um, they've never had the opportunity to design services from scratch. They've kind of sprung up organically. Mm -hmm. And when a service springs up organically, um, it's always there are always bits that don't quite work together yeah. um, or it might be that they've never had the opportunity to think about it from what a user or the customer would yeah. want. Um, so I do a lot of work kind of helping to sort out all of those kind of the dark bits of mm -hmm. how things work together mm -hmm. and so everything from um, the digital touch points of course but then it could be how does it work with your store how does it work with the call center how does it work with your operations team how does it work with the organization as well you know by by working in management consulting for a really long time and getting slightly frustrated with how um, I felt yeah. that we were kind of adding more to the problem than helping. <laughs> really? I started, I started um, studying some design and I worked out that actually that there were better methods to do things um, and to work with people to kind of help solve their problems. And I um, started to apply some of those methods and found it just simplified everything. I found that a lot of the kind of traditional management consulting tools that were out there uh, that I was kind of applying in the work that mm -hmm. I was doing were really just not making things any better. What advice would you give to management consultants watching us there <laughs> that are struggling yeah. the same way that you used to and kind of thinking there must be a better way? I would advise to just open your mind a little bit and start yeah. to learn about kind of human-centered design and all the different fields of design um, and start to try and approach things slightly differently on the kind of a less assumptions-based approach okay. is, is what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. um, especially because there's so much data out there that you, you think will tell you exactly what someone's going to do. That can't be, you, you can't replace having a conversation with someone, doing some ethnographic research, um, actually following them through their lives. You just can't, you can't replace that. And you also can't make assumptions about how people are going to behave either. Um, that would be my advice. It's so great that people have time to explore something that is not their day-to-day -day job. Yeah, so absolutely. So how, how do you balance this work and life and other activities in the office? Yeah, uh, I think if you spoke to anyone here, you would find that that's probably one of the biggest things about who we are kind of as a, as a business. Um, people definitely go home on time. Um, we and on time is 5.30, 6? Yeah, thereabouts, okay. I would say. Um, we we make sure it's a really important part of our culture that um, that people have time and space and um, and that they get to manage their own time as mm -hmm. well. Um, we're not really like clock watchers. <laughs> so people um, are responsible for themselves and they respond accordingly. So um, we have a, actually we've had a big feature recently on um, side hustles too. Mm -hmm. So a big part of our um, kind of team is that we have uh, kind of very flexible working policies. So we have 
uh, someone in my team who is a chef and so she works four days a week and she yeah she runs she's off this week because she was catering at the Australian Embassy for oh Australia Day oh my god yeah, she like, careers in yeah mind. seriously that is a big gig yeah wow. so so she was off, she's off doing that this week um, we have uh, someone from the design team who runs a magic school um, magic with school. a team yeah. yes yeah which is fantastic um, we've got uh, another designer who has his own kind of range of chili sauces. So there are people with really interesting kind of side businesses as well. I like the idea of side hustles. I yeah. think that's something that lots of companies need to introduce because yeah. I don't think it's any more about one career and kind of going to the office. It's about exploring yes. everything that you might want to do or you want to do. Absolutely. Everything, everything in that kind of side hustle um, area brings something back to your work as well. And especially with service design being such a relatively new field yeah. of expertise, yes. um, how someone becomes a service designer, what's the journey? So if you think about the traditional kind of designer tea, um, most people have the top of the tea as a service designer, mm -hmm. so they have some kind of background in, so if you think about our team, it's a mix of people who've come from um, like org design or they've come from uh, kind of a more of product design mm -hmm. background. Some of the other people that I know um, who are fantastic service designers have got a graphic design background. So they're um, a whole mix of different fields of design and then they kind of through interest and experience, mm -hmm. mostly um, service designers are growing through kind of that professional experience. They grow into the service element as kind of the top of the tea. So it's one of those things where you don't necessarily come straight out of university and mm -hmm. become a service designer but uh, increasingly that's happening but traditionally it had been that you would kind of work through one area of design and then kind of grow into a service designer. Why do you live in London? <laughs> no, I live in London. I live in London because of the culture. I love plays and music and theatre and I just went to see The Ferryman last night. It was fantastic. I haven't been to the theatre in ages. It was so good. Um, I, I live here because of that. I, I live here because it's the centre of Europe um, that, you know, <laughs> pending. Um, <laughs> I live here for all of those great reasons yeah. um, and I think that we get kind of the best bits of, um, of what comes out of Europe from a design standpoint mm -hmm. as well here. So when you think about kind of service design and how it emerges to practice, um, you think about kind of live work, you think about uh, Milan and, and how they're teaching fantastic um, service design courses there. A lot of the people who are coming out of those courses come to London and set up shops. So for example, like Liveworth came to London and set up, set up shop here. Um, you know, IDEO in London, a lot of those kind of traditional design consultancies um, found their home in London as well. And I think that that has created a, a fantastic vibe around um, design just generally and creativity. And obviously it's such a cultural melting pot. There's so many people here who aren't from here too. I think it's so special in that sense. Definitely. Yeah. I 100% agree yeah. with you. London, I think, is the capital of the creative world. Yes. So I definitely think that all these things help. Okay, last, last yes. question for you. Yeah, sure. Give some um, advice to everyone who is watching us and wants just to be a bit better at what they're doing. What should they do? Practice. Don't be afraid, just do, start doing and practice. Oh, that's a brilliant advice. Um, thanks a lot, Jess. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot, everyone, for watching us. Thanks, Callum. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Callum, for filming us. And uh, Jess will be one of our speakers during Design Thinking and Innovation Week in March. So everyone who's coming will ask even more questions and find Hopefully. out even more things about what Adaptive Lab is all about. So guys, uh, see you in March. And uh, thanks a lot, Jess. Thank you. Nice to see you. Until next time. Cheers. Cool.